Welcome to r slash Entitled People, where we share stories from your lives about people who think the rules don't apply to them and they should get what they want. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel and for so many likes. And today we have two great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story, Confronting the Mexican Karen, a tale of entitlement, culture clash, and triumph at 30,000 feet. The second story, The Revolt of the Replacements, Unappreciated tech warriors rise and leave, shaking the foundations of a neglectful IT empire. The first story is, I thought there were no Karens in Mexico until I found one at the airport. So I'll put it in context first. The point is, I swear I thought the Karen phenomenon only happens in the United States, because we usually visit our church headquarters at least once a year. We belong to a congregation with headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. And in those trips I've received insults in Walmart or other stores by ladies for not speaking English well, or comments that I do not understand, but according to those who accompany me, are completely horrible, like discrimination and xenophobia things. Apparently something very common in the southern states. Even on one occasion in the middle of an outlet, a man called the police because he swore that I was the leader of a Mexican cartel. No, I'm not short. I'm tall, light-skinned, long-haired, bearded, and chubby. I usually dress in denim. No patterned shirt or long sleeve design and no hat. The pastor of my church believes that that guy accused me in that way because he listens to me in a call with my best friend. Clearly with my friend I do not speak English, and we are not used cordial words if you understand me. The point is that when I'm visiting ATL and something like that happens to me, I don't usually give it importance because I and others thought that it was something cultural. You know, it is very American to believe in the idea of belittling others or having this type of entitled person attitude and therefore we assume the idea of respecting their culture. This is something that I share with other Mexicans or people from Latin America who have had similar experiences. However, in retrospect, I was very naive and foolish to believe that this type of attitude is a cultural situation. Rather, it is a phenomenon that is assigned a different name in each country. In Mexico, I think it would be the phenomenon of ladies and lords. So I apologize if you consider that I was rude or think that it is something cultural. Well, I think I've made the context clear. Now the story. I'm a high school teacher, currently in my 30s. Like all teachers, I earn quite low for what I do, but I know how to manage. I work in Mexico City, but I'm originally from the North. On my vacations, I usually buy my plane tickets in advance, and always save to buy first class or business class. The reason is very simple. Luggage is usually more allowable and heavier on local flights within the country, so it gives me the freedom to buy many gifts for my parents and especially for my nephews and nieces, because of course the single uncle of the family. Three years ago, just before the pandemic hit, I was at the MCX airport to catch the flight that would take me to spend spring break with my family. Already in the security area, I had behind me a woman of about 30 years old, short hair, light complexion, with heels and casual dress, quite annoyed because she had to be behind me. I should point out that she was clearly Mexican by the ID she presented, which here is called INE, with a clearly dyed brown hair and an air of superiority. And her comments were of the type, why I always get behind a fat creep or with those clothes, he looks like homeless. He shouldn't be here. If you have traveled to Mexico, you will know that we all go through the same security screening area, whether it's first class or economy. No one airport has a VIP screening area. I usually travel as comfortable as possible, wearing sportswear to avoid removing my belt or jacket, and with only a backpack and one other item. Of course, in my three checked bags with the maximum weight. On that trip, my other item was a bag with bide homemade bread that my mother likes very much. When the security officer asked about my bag, I answered about the bread and the comment of the woman behind me was like, how ordinary to travel in a plane like a country person. How ordinary to travel by a plane like a hick, like a vile peasant. I didn't say anything, but the security guy told her to shut up while he questioned me. I left the area, grabbed my things and quickly went to the premier lounge to wait for my flight. Just as my flight was announced, I approached to the counter and I was asked to line up in the sky priority line. Obviously, my ticket was business class. I was sitting quietly with my headphones in line when suddenly I see the same woman approaching the counter in anger mood. I didn't take off my headphones at all, but she was clearly talking about me as she pointed at me a couple of times. I guess complaining and asking why I was in line was sky priority. The counter attendant I guess explained to her that I was a premier member and something like that, as this clearly upset the woman who left more upset and went to her line number five. This row is the last row in the row where you clearly have no assigned seat no luggage, and you run the risk of being left out by overselling the flight. Another point to point out is that on that flight, all the business class passengers were well-dressed, and I, with my sportswear and as a plus-size person, 
I think I stood out among them. Obviously, I boarded first and the woman boarded until the last seats. When she passed by my side, she gave me the most repulsive face I could ever ask for. A few minutes later, and when the flight attendants had just closed the door, this woman walked from the back of the plane to stand next to me and told me in a friendly voice, I need you to change my seat. It is your obligation as a man. I replied, excuse me? She said, no, it's not fair for me as a lady to be in the last seats while you go in the first class. And with that, I was shocked because she was making me look like the bad guy. In that moment, another woman and her husband told me, she's right. That's not the way to behave. Give her your seat. I guess they thought we were relatives or something because that woman was using the words on her advantage. When the flight attendant came to ask what was going on, the woman replied, well, it's wrong that he's in my seat and he doesn't want to move. The flight attendant asked us for our tickets and IDs. She checked the info and said, the seats are correct, ma'am. The gentleman is in his seat. You're in the last row. At that point, the lady from before interrupted and said to the flight attendant, no, he should give up his seat to the lady, but he doesn't want to be a good man with his relative. Another passenger said, change the effing seat. He should be a gentleman. I snap out of my shock as the flight attendant says, I can't do anything if he doesn't want to change. And I answer, but I paid for my seat. Besides, I don't know this woman at all. The flight attendant asks me, isn't she your wife? And I answer, no. Isn't she a relative or friend? I tell her more confident, no, no way. She turns to the woman and asks, if it's not your relative or friend, why are you demanding a seat? The woman answers, because I can't believe that someone like him, who dresses like a homeless and has no manners or education, can travel in first class, while I, as a fine lady, shouldn't be in a seat in the back. At that moment, a sigh of astonishment was heard in the premier cabin, where clearly those who had sided with that woman immediately regretted it. The flight attendant replied calmly, ma'am, don't be rude to the gentleman. He doesn't have to give up his seat just because you think so. And if the gentleman is in this area, it's because unlike you, he can pay for premier class tickets and be a gold member. So go back to your seat because we're about to take off. Between some silent laughs and before the woman could say anything, the passengers of the premier and economy premier area started to shout at her. Sit down, you ridiculous. Put the clown down. In between one rude remark or another, this woman went embarrassed down the aisle to her seat, escorted by the flight attendant and I swore that we were just missing the bell to be like Cersei's walk of shame in Game of Thrones. I don't need to explain that some passengers and the flight attendant apologized to me. And what happened was the gossip that circulated from mouth to mouth throughout the flight. Upon landing in my hometown, I got off the plane and as quickly as possible took my luggage. Because to be honest, I was already uncomfortable with the whole situation. And when I got out and saw my sister waiting for me, was when I could finally put a name to that woman. Basically, I understood that she had been a Mexican Karen, the first one that I had faced in my own country. Yes, my sister's name is Karen, but she's not a Karen. <laughs> the second story is... We're all replaceable? Good, because you'll have to find replacements now. So some background on the company I worked for. We were a company that did IT for other companies. Though we had a few hundred companies that we managed, we only had four full-time technicians on staff, a part-time employee, one operations manager, and the owner. We were painfully understaffed and expected to be on call 24-7 no matter what. The owner was previously a Mormon bishop and self-proclaimed capitalist. Also was never one to accept that a problem could lead back to him. There were a few conversations around the office about wages, mostly started by myself because I'm a dirty socialist. The owner had pulled me into the office a few times over this, stating, company morale, but it only made me laugh as I knew it was perfectly legal to talk about wages at work. A few weeks before all of this, himself and the operations manager take a two-week vacation. During this time, things blew up. I mean, literally a storm came through and blew up a few modems, leaving whole companies without internet or even an internal network. While at the same time, Windows had rolled out an update that completely killed thousands of computers. So while they were sitting on a beach yelling at us about how we aren't doing anything, we were literally having the worst week in our company's entire history. We almost lost our biggest clients because of this. Well, to add on to the already growing disdain of the owner and operations manager, we would all come in half an hour early every Monday for meetings. And in more than a few of those meetings, the owner had said that we were all replaceable and that he'd be better off without us. Around this time, he was also trying to rework the contracts with our clients to raise the prices, meaning he really couldn't afford to lose the few full-time techs he had. We were also not allowed to work from home at all unless it was a holiday, which really sucked because our office was in a basement and things were constantly falling apart. We didn't even have a water fountain and had to hope there were bottles of water or else we would just be thirsty. So needless to say, there was a growing number of things that really started to weigh down on the main techs. One of these techs had just filed for divorce and was going to move halfway across the country to his hometown. He wasn't the most skilled tech, but he kept the energy levels high with personality, so it was nice having him with the company. 
though him leaving also meant there was going to be a lot of weight carried by the other two techs and myself. To prepare for this, the owner pulled me into his office to tell me a raise would be coming my way soon. Great, because I didn't get one the year before, and was very underpaid for what I did. Around this time, though, I had already updated my resume, so interviews and offers were flying in faster than I expected. One of the potential offers was over double what I was making, and I really respected that company as well. So I took a morning off for the interview. It went great, but I wasn't completely sold. I wanted to see what my current company would put down as a counteroffer. I loved my clients despite everything else. Upon arriving to the office that day, I found that there was a water leaking in under my desk and mold was starting to get really bad, which I'm very allergic to. Then I hear my boss screaming at the top of his lungs at the employee that was due to leave the next week. He was screaming him out of the company for telling the owner he wanted to see his family and couldn't work the weekend before leaving, so probably not a good time to talk to him about counter offers. The next week, the owner pulls me into his office to say that he would rather hire two people for less money than give me a raise. So that would be two years without a raise, and in that time, my responsibilities had skyrocketed. I would also have been the one training these two new hires while taking over all the companies the other tech was leaving. I informed him that I would either be getting a set amount of money effective immediately, or would be turning in my two weeks notice. I ended up turning in my two weeks notice. This would hurt the company more than the owner knew it would though. As despite his belief that I was the cause of low company morale, I was actually the only one that made sure everyone was doing okay and helped with any issues another tech was working on. Sometimes taking minutes to do things taking them days of work to do. If there was a question on how to do something, I was the person that question was brought to and I helped with a smile. Though I also have some heads up to the techs that I was getting other offers before telling the owner. Seeing the number on my offers had them raising questions about their own worth when I was the lowest paid technician. Well, that ended up being an itch to the back of the other two co-workers' brains because when I quit, two more two weeks notices were put in, meaning every single one of the full-time technicians were gone. Leaving the company with only part-time workers freshly coming in with zero experience. I've heard a few of the bigger companies we managed were leaving and they were quoted as saying they would only work with me and if I wasn't there, they'd find another IT provider. This happened around the same time the owner was trying to refresh contracts to raise prices. So yeah, tell your employees they're replaceable. They'll call your bluff. I hope you loved these stories. Subscribe, hit the like button, and turn on notifications. Thank you for watching and have a good day.